he'll uh, speak to us a bit about the history of stage magic uh, in a presentation uh, titled Fear, um, Fraud and Fascination. Um, and so please welcome uh, Matt Risk. Since the beginning of time, people have been fascinated with this idea of spirits. Gods, demons, angels, elves, whites, trolls, whatever you want to call it, the ghosts of the dead, the, the idea that there is a world of invisible beings right next door waiting for us to contact it has been a source of fascination for many people. Um, and the idea has also brought as many uh, believers as skeptics and as many uh, believers on all sides of the spectrum of thought as well. Um, now, I can ask the question, I don't expect honest answers, but are there any people here who believe in spirits? Okay, several, good, all right. So, um, is, is there anyone amongst you believers who wants to help me out with an experiment here, a proof? Okay. No, no, you can remain seated. Um, what, I, what I'll have you do is just to, to think of a, a number between a, a, a two-digit number, we'll say. Okay. What do you think? Okay. Are you sure? Well, you're such a nag. Okay. All right. So I've got it written down here now. Um, can you just tell everybody what, what your number was? 34. And why did you choose 34? You don't know? It just came to you. Okay. So here, you can take, take this card and just uh, read what's written on it for us. 34. 34. Good. All right. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, that was the help of my, my spirit guide. Uh, now, um, the other thing that you'll find is that wherever there is a strong belief that people invest a lot of energy into, there is somebody to cash in on that belief. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, we'll go through, through history a little bit. We see from the beginning of time, uh, the shaman had the role of speaking as intermediary between the spiritual world and the rest of the tribe. At some point in European history, at any rate, which I'm going to focus on a little bit, um, that changed because of the intervention, of course, of the, the church. Anybody who was speaking to a spirit was either clergy or murdered, burnt at the stake, tortured horribly. And that put an end to it, at least until sometime in the late Renaissance when people started to become literate and were able to read the Bible and recognize that the seven major sacraments of the Catholic Church were not anywhere in the Bible. And this, of course, made them question uh, the authority of the church, and this led to the Protestant Reformation and uh, the practice of hermetic magic, uh, which was uh, the idea that you could achieve a state of uh, union with the divine in a secular setting without the intervention of a priest or a structure of religion. Later, uh, we find a curious phenomenon arising. Sometime in the mid-19th uh, century, uh, sorry, I just tapped the microphone there, um, Two sisters in uh, upper state New York by the name of Catherine and Margaret Fox decided to play a trick on their mother. They had uh, heard the reputation that their house that they had recently moved into was haunted and decided that they would, in the absence of any para paranormal phenomenon, decided to make some. So uh, soon after that decision, uh, a number of weird thumping sounds were heard and scraping sounds, which they very easily convinced their, their, uh, their mother was the ghost that lived in the house. Now, the, the uh, younger sister, Kate, challenged the ghost to repeat this, the pattern of snapping fingers and discovered that the ghost would repeat the pattern of her snapping fingers. Then they developed a code of one tap for yes, two taps for no, and were able to enter a conversation with the ghost itself, 
Um, at first, they called, they called it Mr. Splitfoot, which is a very commonly known name for the devil at the time, but later the name of the ghost changed, um, and uh, revealed itself to be the ghost of a tinker who had been murdered in the house and was buried in the basement. They found the bones. Of course, it may have been quite common for people to be buried in basements of houses at that time. Um, and word got around town. And all the people who lived in the town started coming to see these wonderful sisters and to have them speak to the spirits of their dearly departed. Um, they also started, some people who were earnest fans of theirs started looking into other people who had lived in the house previously and discovered that a man living on the edge of town had once lived there and he became shunned in his own village as a murderer. Um, later, they conscripted the help of their other sister, Leah, and went on tour, performing seances all over, uh, all over the States, all over the world. They went to Europe. They, they went all over the place. All kinds of famous people came out to their, to their seances to speak to the dead. Uh, at this point, they had many uh, scientific debunkers looking into them, couldn't find any evidence that they were doing anything. Um, uh, and uh, many copycats who saw what they were doing and decided that they could do something similar or something completely different that would lead to the same conclusions. As a result of this, a new religion was formed, a religion that promised people proof that there is life after death. This, of course, was an idea that people really dearly wanted. In fact, if you look into um, the, one of the major promises of almost every world religion you find the promise that there is life after death. But in most of those, you have to take it on faith. Now here was a religion that promised proof. All kinds of proof. People would have um, missing objects suddenly appear months later in the middle of a seance. People would see the medium go into a trance and pull ectoplasm out of their orifices. I'll say orifices because it wasn't just their mouths, honestly. There was, there was one famous medium who performed her routine completely naked, and yeah, the ecto <laughs> I'll leave it off there. Um, so, um, spiritualism became a very common uh, religion. Uh, it was also tied in with a number of other social movements at the time, which, which were very popular, and uh, word spread. Now, looking back on it, we can... If we, if we take a look at why uh, people were so interested in, in these concepts or in the practice of spiritualism, you know, some of the things that I've said are already uh, should make it obvious. The, the idea that, that, A, you can have proof that there's life after death in front of you is something that a lot of people would have a very strong emotional need for that to be true. Um, another uh, was that you could have closure with, with, with your loved ones after their death. And for a lot of people who have experienced uh, a death in the family, that's something that is of great value. To, to know that you can have final words, particularly if, say, Uncle Jimmy uh, left a large amount of money hidden somewhere in the property, that kind of thing. Although that's usually not what, what mediums would reveal in those instances. Um, they would usually shy away from questions like that. Um, so, the, but, uh, it wasn't just that sort of person who was interested in spiritualism. There were also a lot of prominent scientists who were interested in spiritualism as well. Um, the idea that uh, the human mind or that, or that the human personality could be um, a measurable field that was not attached to the body was, was very popular, especially in, with the advent of radio technology uh, and electromagnetism. Uh, in fact, we have... Um, uh, Michael Faraday was one of the first people to perform a debunking of spiritualism uh, because he was interested in it. He wanted to, he wanted to know uh, whether it was real or not. Uh, one of the practices that spiritual, some spiritualists would do would be uh, table turning, where a number of people would stand around a table, put their fingers on the edge of it, and the table would start to move and turn around. And of course, this was undeniable proof of spiritual intervention. However, Faraday thought about it a little bit differently and invented a device. There were two devices that he used. The first one was 
layers of cardboard that were uh, glued together, very uh, um, tacky glue, but not fast glue, if you know what I mean, uh, designed to prove uh, the direction of force in the table turning. So if the force was coming from underneath, from a spirit moving the table, then the cards at the bottom would have moved more than the cards at the top. But what he discovered, of course, was that the cards at the top were moving more than the cards at the bottom, proving, of course, that it was an uh, autodidactic response in the hands of the, the, the people present that were, that were involved in the turning of the table. This, of course, brings us to the very popular uh, Ouija board. Now, uh, I used to work in a New Age shop, and we sold Ouija boards. And I heard so many stories about how diabolical and evil they were. People would come in terrified of them. People, people that otherwise would be very rational, um, non-believers, would look at the Ouija board and see evidence of diabolical action. They would all have stories about the sorts of things that showed up, the sorts of horrible things that were spelled out. Uh, now, of course, um, Faraday's experiment does prove how the planchette moves, but not why it spells things out. Now, why it spells things out is another matter entirely. However, there was another scientist. I believe it was uh, Braid. Um, I'll check through my notes later. He, he, uh, performed, he, he created a device that would um, monitor the direction of movement in people's hands with a pencil line on a paper. So he placed their hands on, on the device and then talk about an object in the room. And as soon as they started thinking about that object, the pencil line would move towards that object. So uh, what we have here is an instance in which thinking about a particular letter could lead the planchette to moving towards that letter. So then we have a phenomenon similar to to automatic writing, where, it, where it's actually the unconscious of the minds of the people present that are, that are spelling the words out. Um, it was uh, Sarah Blackmore, I believe her name is. She's well known uh, these days for her work with, with memes, but uh, less known, she was uh, involved in parapsychology in her early career and studied Ouija boards quite extensively and was a firm believer that there was something strange going on there until the day when she decided to perform experiments with people uh, blindfolded. Now, of course, blindfolded, they could still spell out words, and, oh, that's amazing. There must be a spirit spelling out these words. But what if we turn the board upside down? Complete chaos and nonsense ensued. The planchette would move to the position where the letters would be had it been upright, but of course all the people who were blindfolded had no idea that she had turned the board around, and of course that made that look a little silly. Um, anyways, where was I here? <clears throat> so it was, uh, it, it, there, there were also some other famous uh, people in, involved in spiritualism in the, in the early days as well. Uh, who here has, has seen any of the, the recent BBC Sherlock episodes? Um, good. Now, uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is a, is a well-known, there's footage of him talking about spiritualism. In fact, his wife was a spiritualist medium. Um, he was also friends with Harry Houdini. Uh, Harry Houdini is one of the first professional debunkers of spiritualists. Uh, and what, he, uh, th th what got him into that, because of course he was, he was very interested in the idea of life after death, um, and that it being provable, um, up until sometime after his mother died. Now, now anybody who knows anything about the, the story of Harry Houdini knows that he was, he was a total mama's boy, really. He, he loved his mother so much. He never, he, he would do everything for his mother. And they had actually both talked extensively in life about how after she died, she would find some way to come back to give him a special code to let him know that there is life after death. Um, she dies, he goes into mourning, he starts doing uh, really dangerous escapology, like being uh, strapped into a um, uh, straitjacket, sorry, and hung upside down, hundreds of feet in the air, um, with, by a rope that is set on fire. Um, this sort of thing, you know, total death-defying acts uh, that he became quite well known for later um, in his career, but certainly spurred on by his grief over his mother's death. Now, uh, 
Conan Doyle uh, and his wife decide to help their friend through his grieving process by inviting him to a seance in which Conan Doyle's wife channels the spirit of, of Harry Houdini's mother. And the message went something like, oh, Harry, I'm fine. It's great over here. I'm in the hands of the Christ and the cross is above me. I'm in heaven. Everything is great. So uh, not only lacking the secret message that, he, that she was supposed to relate to him, uh, the code word, but also um, calling him by his stage name, because of course his real name was Eric, uh, and she never called him Harry. Uh, and she was also a Jew. So <laughs> uh, Her Houdini was so repulsed by how such hackney tricks could fool anyone that he decided to um, spend a great deal of time setting up across the road from famous spiritualists and doing the exact same routine that they would do only as stage magic. Um, and uh, just to put a cap on that, we have a, uh, a modern equivalent of that as well in former Torontonian James the Great Randy, who, uh, um, although a believer that there could be a paranormal activity in the universe and that he's open to that idea, has set up a foundation that will grant a million dollars to anybody who can prove under laboratory conditions that they have these abilities. Um, Sylvia Brown has turn, turned them down for 30 years, uh, saying that she'll do it and then never showing up. Um, but uh, he, uh, in, uh, I believe it was 1983 or 84, uh, went to, in disguise to a spiritualist meeting of a famous faith healer who was drawing a multi-million dollar business in, in uh, uh, telling uh, old women to throw away their cancer medication because the power of Christ had healed them of their illnesses uh, by the name of Peter Popov. Now, um, Popov would, of course, hear messages from the angels uh, and then tell people in the audience, by, call them by name, tell them their address, tell them what their problem is, and then tell them to throw away their medicine because Christ had healed them. Um, but uh, Ra James, the amazing Randy, I'll call him the amazing for, for here on out, noticed uh, two things that were interesting. When he came into the building, there was a, um, there was a, uh, a, a table with a, uh, a big pot and some papers. And you're, you're, you're supposed to fill out a, a, a prayer form that had your name and address on it and what you wanted healed. And that, that would go into a big vat and then, I don't know, how they presented it. Um, and the other thing that, that the amazing noticed was that uh, Popov had an earpiece in. So he returned uh, a day later with a uh, friend of his who was quite involved with radio technology, and they tapped into the frequency uh, of the earpiece and discovered uh, something very interesting, uh, which they later played on The Tonight Show, um, which was... Uh, Popov's wife reading from the prayer cards. Uh, and they took the, the footage of Peter Popov doing his, his amazing healings, superimposed the sound from, from the radio frequencies on it, and we saw the only time in Johnny Carson's career that he swore on national television. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to uh, close with, with one more uh, volunteer, if I may. Um, I have a deck of cards here, and uh, I'm going to allow the spirits to, to select, to, to move the hand of, of my volunteer, whoever, do I have it? Please. Um, could you mind uh, stepping up to the, the podium? Um, and I'll just, I'll just show this off here that, that this is indeed, you can see and verify for people that this is indeed a real a deck of cards. It is... A full deck? Okay. okay yeah. Okay. Now I'm just going to shuffle it slightly, just to, to randomize it, of course. Okay. Good? More? No. It's up to you. Okay. Now, I will rifle through it, and you just tell me when to stop. stop. Right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Take your card. And do you mind showing that to the audience? Okay. Does everybody see that? You all know what that card is? People at the back, you saw the card? Okay, now you ma'am in the, in the green sweater, um, do you mind reaching underneath your chair 
you'll find uh, taped to the bottom of your chair an envelope. Do you mind opening that? Please hurry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> and uh, do you mind holding that up for the audience to see? The eight of diamonds in each case. Thank you. <laughs>